But Daniel chapter 11, verse 40 says, at the, at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, that is the king of the north, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with mighty ships. And he shall enter into the countries and shall overthrow, overflow and pass over. He shall enter into the glorious land and many countries shall be overflown, but, shall, but he, but these shall escape out of his hand. Even Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon. He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. But he shall have power over all the treasures of gold uh, and of silver, and over the precious things of Egypt and of Lib and the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Bible prophecy. It does intrigue us and draw us to, to, to study it just so that we can know some things that you say will take place in the future. But Father, may we not just do it as, as if we're, we're studying or listening to some soothsayer or poem reader. But Father, may we realize that you're the God, the sovereign God of the universe, that you've created heaven and earth for a purpose and you've created man for the purpose of glorifying you and, and men who do not will have their end with all those who have rebelled against you. And Father, may we realize that the words of your, your, your scriptures are true words and these are actual events. There's no escaping. And may we study this in fear and in reverence. For it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. We've already studied the very fact that, that verses 40 through 43 is the seventh conflict, and that's why this has been a long chapter, seven different conflicts between the south and the north, between Egypt and whoever's controlling the land north of Israel. We've said several times. Could be Russia, like a lot of people like to believe. Could be Turkey, which seems to what the book of Revelation would indicate to me. Uh, it could be Rome, and definitely Rome will have a part of, of this last ruling as they were a part of the times when Jesus Christ came. And this last empire is a revived Roman Empire, just kind of divided into ten fractions and headed up by a person who has arisen throughout this chapter and become the king of the north, who we know as the Antichrist. The book of Revelation calls him the beast. Now, as we go through this, not only has he arisen, and, and now this is the seventh conflict, but we're already past the center of tribulation where he, he, the Antichrist, the political leader of the king of the north, has also set himself up as being Israel's Messiah, claimed to be God, and now has caused a great persecution. And that is for, as we read back in verses 30 and 31 uh, through 33 there, that, that he took away the sacrifices and he set up the abomination. Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he is the abomination. He wor had people worship him as if he's God. And then those who understood the true God, who Jesus Christ was, the Messiah, the true Messiah of Israel, have, done, have now instructed many and have suffered the consequences. They've done many heroic deeds and some have, have died and, and given their life in testimony uh, of Jesus Christ. And there's great persecution that he's brought upon the nation of Israel. Then Egypt, as we read over here in verse 40, decides one more time and for the last time, that they are going to go up against him. And as you look again in the end of verse 42, Egypt does not escape out of his hand. But there are some, some, it says in verse 40, that did escape out of his hand. See, Egypt, and this is a map of Israel. This whole map is just a real big blown up portion uh, of, of Israel. It's only 120 miles from Jerusalem to the top of this map. So you get a, a distance. You know, sometimes you look at a map, you don't know how much distance you're looking at. But here's a map of the nation of Israel. Here's Jerusalem, the center of, of there, yeah, big words, Jerusalem, the center of all God's activity where, where Jesus Christ will come and on a hill in Jerusalem, Mount Zion, will reign someday. It becomes the center of all Bible prophecy. There is the king of the north that's north of here and the king of the south is south of here. And as they come up against each other, Israel's always caught in between. That's why you read he comes through to the glorious land. Uh, it's interesting that the ones who escape, it says in verse 40, that says, And at the time of the end, the king of the south shall push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him with, with whirlwind, with chariots, with, 
and with many ships. Now he's got a navy. The last time he was defeated because he didn't have a navy, but he's prepared now. And he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. And he shall enter into the glorious land and many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand. Edom, Moab, and the chief of, uh, and the, chief of the children of Ammon. Interesting the order that that said. There's uh, Edom down here, Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. If you would look on a Bible map that has it, this one doesn't, but this is the Jordan River that cuts down Israel when they first went into the Promised Land, crossed the Jordan River, and went in and fought at the Battle of Jericho. They came out of the wilderness of Egypt, and they came up on the east side of the Dead Sea and on the east side of the Jordan River, and then they crossed in. Now, when you read about those, those three places, Edom, Moab, and the children of Ammon, what you're talking about is the lands that are on the east of the Jordan River, from the south all the way to the north. The south is pushing toward the north. The north's coming down, and he's so interested in the south, he comes through the main section of Israel. He don't come through this section. And so the people on this side escape as he begins to take over and destroy and win some countries. Now, why does that information in the Bible? Well, I can give you a good reason why I think it's there. Come with me to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. God has made a promise to the nation of Israel that when this abomination sets up, and what you have in Revelation chapter 12, a heavenly view of it, Satan is cast out of heaven. Chapter 13 of Revelation is what the Antichrist does once he gets here. And, and that's where you have the number 666 and the worship of him is all in Revelation 17. But as you look at it from a heavenly point of view in chapter 12, there is there's a, uh, a man-child born in the beginning of this chapter. Now, our, our point isn't to study who that man-child is. The woman who brought forth the man-child is definitely the nation of Israel as the types are given in the first couple verses. The man-child is caught up into heaven, and I would believe that the man-child is the 144,000 that God is using to get his message out to the world before the Antichrist comes and, and deceives the world. And, and I believe the 144,000 are taken out of the earth in the middle of the tribulation period. But the nation of Israel is not. It says in verse 6, it says, And the woman, Satan is cast out of heaven, and it says, And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she had a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. That's, that's three and a half years. The middle of tribulation, Satan is cast out of heaven, and what happens is the man of sin, the political leader, becomes the son of perdition. Satan's cast out of heaven down to the earth, and he'll energize that man. Demon possess him, but possess with the devil himself. He'll become the son of perdition. At that point, he begins to do what Satan always wanted to do, would be worshipped as God. He ends the sacrifice, sets up the abomination, orders all to worship him, and whoever doesn't worship him, that they should be killed. Now, Israel, when they're told about this, when the Lord talked about it in Matthew 24, verse 15, he says, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, flee into the wilderness. Why? Well, as you read about it here, Israel, the woman, flees into the wilderness. God has a place in the wilderness to protect the nation of Israel. Those who will flee in time and get out of the city in time will be preserved through the tribulation unto the end by the supernatural protection of God and even the supernatural feeding of God just like they were in the wilderness in the time of Egypt. And manna came down from heaven and fed them. There's going to be a means by which God is supernaturally going to preserve, protect, and feed the nation of Israel in the wilderness. This, my friend, <laughs> is wilderness. This is how they came from Egypt, through the wilderness, and then into the promised land. They're going to go back out into the wilderness, and God's going to protect them out there in that area of Edom, Moab, and the chief part of Ammon. Now, the, now you, you read it here. Look over in verse 13. It says, And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, Satan is always the dragon, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. He's after Israel. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness unto, the place, unto her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and a half a times. Time, 
times, there's two, that's plural, that's three, and a half a time, three and a half years again. The face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water uh, as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. So he's after her, whether militarily or actually caused the floods that area, trying to get them because they're hiding. They're hiding in dens and holes. They're hiding in caves, apparently. And, and I'll show you why I say that. Verse 16 says, And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened up uh, her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And so God's protecting the nation of Israel. They fled into the wilderness. Now, if you go back with me to the Hosea, we're studying Daniel. Uh, then there's uh, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea. That's where I want you to go. <laughs> the next book after. <laughs> we'll go to Amos or later on. No, Joel later on. But Hosea is where I want you to go now. Hosea chapter 2. In verse 14, now, I'm not going to give you much time to turn there because if you, if you don't have time to turn, you just listen. Hosea chapter 2, verse 14 says, Therefore, and by the way, this is all about Israel who are being judged of God and God's bringing them back to himself. They, they've broken his, 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 his laws and he's bringing them back through judgment. It says in verse 14, Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably unto her. And I will give her the, the vineyards from thence and the valley of Achor uh, for a door of hope. And she shall sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord, that, they shall call, they, that thou shalt call me Ishi, which means Lord, and, and shall no more call, uh, no more, uh, and shall call me no more Baali. For I, have, I will take away the name of Balaam out of, out of her mouth. And, and they, shall no more be re, uh, they shall no more be remembered by their name. And the, in that day will I make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field and with the fowls of heaven and with the creeping things of the ground. And I will break the bow and the sword and the battle out of the earth and will make them to lie down safely. And I will betroth thee unto me Forever, yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercy. That that Ishi isn't the Lord. The last part is they won't be called him Balai, Bala. That that is to call God Lord as if He's Lord Baal, and they're not going to call him that anymore. They're going to call him Ishi. That is my husband. Why? He's going to come back in covenant relationship to Israel. But how does he do that? Well, he's going to drive him out into the wilderness and speak to them, and make them understand who he is, who the Antichrist is. So as they go out there, the thing that's said in verse 15, that I will give, it says, and the valley of Achor for a door of hope. Now, Achor, when they went in and fought Jericho, when they first went in, the second battle they fought was Ai. And there a man got involved in a Babylonian garment, in a wedge of gold, and God judged the nation of Israel to make them understand that you don't mess around with Babylon. That's this, this, this king, he's associated with Babylon. There's a Babylonian religion that this king is associated with. And, and, and here and, and we see this being tied in. In the ancient days, when, they, when God judged them at, at Ai, and they took Achan and stoned him with stones so that he would die, and the garment and the wedge of gold with him. Interesting, you got a Babylonian religious system and money involved in order to worship before you can buy or sell. You've got to take that mark of the beast. Same similarity going on there. That that part where they stoned Achan, they called that place uh, Achor. And there's a valley there where if they were going to flee Jerusalem, you go through the valley of Achor, and the way they came into Israel the first time seems to be God is telling Israel, it's time for you to go back out in the wilderness, learn your lesson, and come back in again. And they go back out through that valley of Achor. Now, and then when he takes them out there, we read in Sunday school, we read a verse how that God's going to bring them in the wilderness and, and uh, deal with them like he dealt with them in, when he brought them out of Egypt, out in the wilderness. And that says that in Ezekiel chapter 20. Uh, one more thought here, and that's in Micah chapter 2. So, yeah, Micah chapter 2.
Micah chapter 2, and it says this concerning the nation of Israel, verse 12. It says, I will surely assemble, O Jacob, all of thee. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel, and I will punish them together, excuse me, and I will put them together as the sheep of Bozrah, as the flock in the midst of their fold. They shall, uh, they shall make great noise by reason of the multitude of men. The breaker shall come up before them. And uh, they have broken up and have passed through the gate and are gone out by it. And their king shall come to pass, uh, come before, shall pass before them and the Lord on the head of them. In other words, what's going on when you talk about the sh- they're going to get, be gathered as sheep? Bozra means it, it's a place, but it means sheepfold. Israel is always God's sheep. They're going to be gathered there, and then their king is going to lead them. The Lord's going to go on ahead of them. They're going to be protected. God's going to lead them. And it begins to talk about that area of Bozra, an important area. We can't hardly pick it up on our map. But if they came out by the valley of Achor, where they went in, and then they started heading downward through from Ammon, Moab, down into uh, Edom, down in Edom, right where our map ends there, there is a, there is a, a city called Bozra. And if you'll notice in the map, I don't know if you can see it where you're at, there's, there's all kinds of hilly countries there. And what you do is when you enter into Bozra, you enter into a real rocky area filled with cliffs and rocks and caves where the nation of Israel can hide out. Uh, there, is a, there is a place even below that that's called Selah, a place of rest, Selah. It's a place where God is going to hide and protect the nation of Israel, and it seems to indicate that that's the place they're going. They have a place they're going to be protected of God. And as the king of the north and the king of the south are fighting, this area is saved. Why? God is protecting his people down there. They're held up in the rocks. They're hiding out. They're waiting for three and a half years to end so that Jesus Christ will come back and bring them back, that through the way of the wilderness, back into the, to the promised land and establish the kingdom with him. And so there's that mention in Daniel chapter 11. Now go back with me again uh, to, to Daniel chapter 11 and watch the next couple verses and some of the things you just learned will tie back in again. Now while he's down there in Egypt, the king of the north went all the way going through the glorious land. Egypt didn't escape. He went right to the edge where, where uh, uh, to, uh, Libyans and the Ethiopians were at his step. He went all the way down through Egypt. He's right down the north end of Africa. While he's down there, look what it says in verse 44. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go, he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and to utterly make away many. That is, to totally, to to annihilate many. I I don't quite understand the English rendering of that, but the the idea there to make away is he's going to take away many. He's going to, he's going to go through, he's got, he's, whatever he hears taking place in the east and the north outrages him to such a point that now it's a matter of annihilation. And it's the nation of Israel that he wants to annihilate. Where he's going to go now, look at verse 45. And he shall plant the tabernacle of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. Yet yet he uh, he shall come to his end and none shall help him. And no one's going to be able to help him. You're going to find some are going to be with him, but none are going to be able to help him. The glorious holy mountain, Mount Zion where Jesus Christ is going to rule, when he's down in Egypt, he hears of tidings out of the east and out of the north that makes him so mad, he goes and he plants his last stand right there in Jerusalem to stand against Jesus Christ. You know what the tidings are that he hears? I think he's hearing about the coming of Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 16. Now, if you got those facts from Daniel, we we probably don't need to go back to Daniel again the rest of the time. But... He hears tidings out of the east, that came first, and then out of the north. And it just brings fury. He just goes with full annihilation, full power to Israel, where there he is going to stand, try to stand, but he doesn't stand. 
and he'll be destroyed right there, and you'll see it in, in other verses of prophecy. Revelation chapter 16, I believe where we're at, in, in what we're reading there in Daniel chapter 11, after that seventh conflict, the eighth conflict, in verses 44 and 45 of Daniel 11, is not the king of the north and the king of the south. It's now the king of the north who is in the south against someone else coming out of the north. And that someone else coming out of the north is the Lord Jesus Christ. Heaven is spoken of as being in the north. And he hears tidings first out of the east and then out of the north. And watch what happens as, as you come to Revelation chapter 16. These are the, the last, there's, 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 uh, there's seal judgments in the book of Revelation. Then there's uh, trumpet judgments in the book of Revelation. And these are called bowl judgment, vials, like a vase, a vial, a bowl judgment. And these are the last of the judgments of the book of Revelation. God's final outpouring of his wrath takes place beginning in Revelation chapter 16. And listen to things that take place. He said, I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven, ange seven angels, Go your way uh, and pour out the vials of, of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth. And there, there fell noisome and grievous sores upon the men. Which, that ha which had the mark of the beast, and upon them that worshipped his image. Now, you know, the Jews that are out here hiding, no sores upon them, is there? Just like there was no sores when God judged Egypt upon the nation of Israel. But upon those who align themselves with him, God pours out a vial and there's great sores upon men. It's just totally annoying to them. There's great sores, boils have come up upon them. Uh, verse 3 says, And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as blood and the de and dead men and of dead men, and every, and every soul died in the sea. Remember we read this man finally had a navy. Come down the Mediterranean, he had a navy helping him. All of a sudden, all the, all the seas turn to blood, all the men, all the navy dies. What I want you to understand is that this last attack this last bold judgment in the book of Revelation is a direct attack from Jesus Christ upon the Antichrist kingdom. He's going right for him now. And, and he's starting from the north and he's coming down and the last stand will take place at Jerusalem. As he's coming down, he's wiping out his navy. The people of his land are all full of swords. Everybody who followed him is full of swords. He wipes out the navy. Verse uh, 4, it says, The third angel pulled up, poured out his vial upon the rivers and the fountains of the water, and they became blood. Now we got fresh water becoming blood. Polluted water now. You don't have a drinking supply. And, uh, and drop down to verse 8. It says, And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And, the men, uh, and men were scorched with great heat. And look what they did. And blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over the plagues. And they repented not to give him glory. Three times in this chapter, the men of the earth blaspheme God. They have chosen who they're going to align with. They've taken the mark of the beast. Jesus Christ, in direct attack to that kingdom, is coming back and attacking. And these men are being now scorched with great fire, getting a taste of hell as he comes back. And they begin to blaspheme him. And, 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 he just, and he's the one who has the power over the plagues. Kind of on the wrong side, aren't they? But he keeps coming. Verse 10, it says, And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast. Now, do you know where the seat of the beast is? We're not going to go there. Revelation, I believe it's chapter 3. The seat of the beast is identified as one of the seven cities that this book of Revelation is written to. And I've told you before, it's in Turkey. And, and, and where are we at here? Well, Turkey's north. He hears tidings out of the north. You know why? He's down in Egypt. Something happened to his homeland. Verse 10 says, The fifth angel poured out his, his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain. Now, this is darkness that the Bible talks about that you can feel. It's such thick darkness. Jesus Christ wipes out the seat of the beast. He's down in Egypt, and his homeland's gone. Can't go back home, can he? No wonder he's full of great fury and goes back to Jerusalem to set up his last defense. But notice those people, they're gnawing with pain. Great heat hit them, now darkness. You know, those are the two things that the Bible tells us, isn't it? 
Hell is a place where there's fire is never quenched. And sometimes the Bible calls it outer darkness. Now, these people are suffering both of those consequences. It's not hell itself, but it's getting closer to it all the time. And as they're going through that, verse 11, "...and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and repented not of their deeds." Now, I said it says it three times. I don't know if we'll read it the third time, but let me stop here and say something to you. Whatever way in your heart you think about God is a way that it'll be developed. If you have a heart that's right before God, that wants to honor God, that you care about what God says, that you, you want to know what He has for you, you want to be with Him, you want to love Him, then no matter what happens to you, all it does is increase that love. Some of the, some of the times that people suffer the most who are Christians come more and more in love with Jesus Christ through the suffering. Just yesterday on the news, a lady lost three of her children, four of her children, I forget what it was, in a fire. She was at her church packing up food baskets for the needy. Come home, lost her children. They interviewed her. She says, God's helping me. God's with me. God will hold me up. Just, just leaning on the Lord to give her the strength, as, just like Job lost it all and did not curse God. Why? He set his heart in that direction, and the trials came and only made him love the Lord more. But you know, if you set your heart the other way, against God, I don't care about God, I don't want God in my life, I don't need God, and the time of hard times come, and you're in those hard times, you know what you do? You blame God for the hard times. They're blaming God for the sores and for the fire and for the heat and for all that they're going through. But they're the ones who will not turn to God. He's calling the nation of Israel to repentance. And, and, and certainly some of the Jews are involved in this. And, and God is calling them, but when the trial comes, their heart wasn't right, so it hardens their heart where they get more matter and matter and blasphemes God. God. Now, I say that to you because you better seek your heart. And you better know where your heart is because there's going to be some hard times in life. You're going to go through them. And if you don't right now, and I don't know if you've got later, so I'll just tell you right now, you better make sure your heart's right before God that you look at Him and realize that He loves you, that Jesus Christ came down and died on the cross for all that's wrong with you, for all your sins, so that you can be saved. He wants to come and fill you with His Holy Spirit, if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior, so that He can give you joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, patience, meekness, temperance. Against such, God wouldn't even have to give you any laws to keep, because He wants to fill your life with goodness. But if you close your heart to Him, and you say, I don't want Him in my life, and you face severe consequences, I'll tell you, at those times, you're not going to say, oh, God's so good, He's so wonderful. You're saying, you'll say, why did God do this to me? I don't know why those Christians worship God. And you'll get colder and colder and colder against God, and if you die in that condition, not trusting Jesus Christ as your Savior, you'll spend eternity in a lake of fire. You've got to be careful. You can't just keep turning the Lord down when you hear the gospel and think that, well, I can trust the Lord later. Every time you turn the gospel of salvation down, you get your heart a little bit colder, a little bit colder against God. And you might get so cold that you'll never turn to Him, no matter what He does. And look at this. Can you imagine that? Everything controlled in His hand. He's defeating the one that they followed, and they're still cursing God and following the Antichrist. Verse 12 says, And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water... Uh, thereof was dried up, and the way, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Oh, his city was destroyed out in the north. And yet, if you watch Revelation, it says he hears tidings out of the east first, then out of the north. Well, keep that in mind. We do see some activity taking place in the north. Now you see some activities taking place in the east. The Euphrates River is dried up, so that a huge, massive army can march from the east toward Jerusalem, toward Israel. Because something's going to take place if you look at verse 13. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon. The, the, Satan is taking forth all the demon activity he can to, to cause uh, something to happen on this earth. It comes out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. And, they're, and, 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 they, and they are the spirits of devils working miracles... People see the devil has power, he's got it. 
working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk, uh, uh, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And he, he, and he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. Here it comes, the battle of Armageddon. Now we call it the battle of Armageddon, but notice it says the place of Armageddon. Now there's a couple things. A great arm, uh, the, the rivers over here that, that block the east uh, from, the, from the Middle East, or from the nation of Israel, it, the river Euphrates dried up. The armies coming out of the east, nothing to stop them to go straight across, come to Israel. God is allowing this because he's ready to meet the armies for a great battle called the Battle of Armageddon. Now, that can be two things. The, the, the word Armageddon itself speaks about the Valley of Megiddo. There it is right there. Which is interesting that when you study the Old Testament, Israel's favorite place to meet for battle was always in that area right there. Even Egypt and Assyria chose that place to come and meet. The king of the north and the king of the south came and met at the Valley of Megiddo for a battle in the Old Testament. And it seems to be a place, uh, a great place for battle because there's mountains around it, but that's a valley. Big open area where massive armies can gather for battle. And here it is, in that north, if that guy's down in Egypt, he hears the tidings out of the north. There is a great battle of, in Armageddon that's going to take place. The Lord Jesus Christ, Psalm 75, comes out of the heavens. As he comes out of the heavens, he judges the northern country. He dries up the Euphrates River. The kings of the east move across so they can meet at, at Armageddon for battle. The Lord Jesus Christ comes down and there's a great battle of Armageddon. And he wipes out the nations of the earth that meet there. But there's, there's countries, there's, there's armies all over the land of Israel. The, the king of the north himself is down in Egypt making his way back to Jerusalem for a place of battle. But the Lord Jesus Christ is coming out of the north, Armageddon, they lose against Jesus Christ. The army's lost. You read that in Revelation chapter 19. Uh, and so you see the tidings out of the east and the tidings out of the north. If you just drop down to verse 21, it says, And there fell upon men great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plagues of hail, for the plagues thereof was exceeding great. You know what a talent weighs? About a hundred pounds. Armies gathered against Jesus Christ, and he just starts hurling hail balls from heaven. Hail balls that weigh a hundred pounds. Can you imagine being hit with one of those things? <laughs> no wonder they're cursing God if they're against him. There's no way they stand against him. He's coming back. The second coming of Jesus Christ is taking place here. And, and one of the other things that you read as you would have read down the line is that the great city in verse 19, Babylon, came into his mind and is destroyed. Another tidings out of the east. Not only was the seed of the beast destroyed, but the city of Babylon, the place where all the Gentiles have their roots, is destroyed by Jesus Christ. And, and he's coming back. And there's, there's, that's the tidings that he's hearing. Uh, come over with me. Let's see here. Isaiah chapter 34. You know, there is, we read in Revelation chapter 12, Satan being cast out of heaven first. The second coming of Christ, there's first a cleansing that takes place in heaven. Then he comes down to earth and cleanses the earth, especially, specifically, the nation of Israel. Isaiah uh, 34, beginning in verse 4, it says, And all the host of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll, and all the hosts shall fall down as, as a leaf falleth from the vine. Well, that falls down, doesn't it? Satan falling from heaven down to the earth. And from, uh, from the vine as, uh, and as the falling uh, fig from the fig tree. Uh, for my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Behold, it shall come down upon Idumea and upon the, the people of my curse to judge. 
the sword of the Lord is filled with blood and is made fat with fatness and, and with the blood of the lamb, of lamb, of lambs and goats and with the fat of, of kidneys of ram. For the Lord hath a sacrifice in Bozrah and a great slaughter in the land of Idumea. You know that Idumea or Idumea? That's just, that's the, just this end, just a little bit on the, on the, in the western end of the, of this dividing line of the Dead Sea. By the way, at the end of the Dead Sea is where Sodom and Gomorrah is at. Just a little bit east of that, that's where Bozrah is at. Just in front of that is Idumea. The, Idumea is actually the whole land and Bozrah is part of that. The Lord comes down from the north. As he's coming down, he turns. He goes past Jerusalem. He comes down and he cuts across from the west over to the east and covers that land of Idumea and Bozrah. Why? There's armies there trying to get those Israel that are hidden in those rocks. And the Lord has a great sacrifice there. He defends the nation of Israel like He said He would. Then He's going to go before them and lead them into the land. Remember that? He's going to come up from that area, Bozrah now, and then He's going to enter from the east into Jerusalem. And, and as He approaches that city, that's where the Antichrist is held up with His armies, and He's got another battle to fight there. Before we leave uh, Isaiah chapter 34, if you look down to verse uh, verse 8, it says, For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompense for the controversy of Zion. It says, And the streams thereof shall be turned into pitch, and the dust thereof into brimstone. And the land thereof shall become burning pitch, and it shall not be quenched night nor day. The smoke thereof shall go up forever. From generation to generation it shall lie waste. None shall pass through it forever and ever. That means when he goes and judges that land down to the south, it's going to become burning pitch that's going to burn forever and ever like brimstone, melted rock, burning there forever and ever. The smoke goes up forever and ever. Doesn't that sound like the lake of fire? Sure does sound like the lake of fire. He has a great sacrifice. He brings Israel out and he takes that land and he judges it and it becomes like a lake of fire that's going to be burning forever and ever here on the earth. You know, when Jesus Christ reigns and people get out of line, the Bible talks about them being thrown in alive into the lake of fire. That's a real thing. That's going to happen. You read it there. The fire never being quenched, that's the fires of hell. But come over with me now to Joel. Joel chapter 2, or chapter 3. Because we've been tracing the Lord's coming... And we've been seeing somewhat of a path of His coming and some judgments that are taking place. Come over to Joel chapter 3, and we get a little bit closer to Jerusalem now. Joel chapter 3, verse 2, it says, And I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and, and, uh, and will plead with them there for my people and my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. Gentiles have taken over my land. I'm going to meet them at the Valley of Jehoshaphat. The city of Jerusalem on the, on the western end of that city is a valley called the Kidron Valley. You hear about it talked about in the news. It's the Valley of Jehoshaphat. South of that is the Valley of Hemen. That's the place, if you're going to attack Jerusalem, that's the battlefields where you're going to attack Jerusalem. The Valley, valley of Hemen, because I'm not going to have time to say it later, that's, Hemen is the word that we get Hades from. So you talk about a, a lake of fire that's going to be even in the valley of Hemen someday where God's going to judge and cast people uh, but in the future. Anyhow, the valley of Jehoshaphat, right there, God's going to meet with the nations. This Antichrist has the nations gathered together. Those that, he, that are with him that weren't in Armageddon are now with him at the valley of Jehoshaphat. And verse 13 says, uh, he, he calls in verse 9, he says, Proclaim ye among the Gentiles, prepare war. Wake up, ye mighty ones. Let all the men of war draw near, let them come up. So God's calling the nation, come on, you want to fight me? I'll meet you at the Valley of Jehoshaphat. Follow the Antichrist there, he's held up there. So he gets there and it says, uh, verse 12, Let the heathen be awakened and come up to the Valley of Jehoshaphat, for there will I sit to judge all the heathen around about. Put ye the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, let us go down, for the press is full, and the fats overflow... And the wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley. Of 
called the Valley of Decision instead of the Valley of Jehoshaphat. You're going to stand against the Lord? You, you actually think that you're going to decide that you can meet, beat the armies of heaven and Jesus Christ as He's coming back to save the nation of Israel? Come on, you want to meet me, he says? Let's go. And it's a valley of decision. He's going to make a decision about them and what he's going to do with them. Verse 9, 15 says, The sun and the moon shall be darkened. Sound like what Peter said in, at Pentecost, didn't he? The sun and the moon shall be darkened. The stars shall withdraw their shining. The Lord shall roar out of Zion. He's going to take it. And utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shall shake, and the Lord shall will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. He wins. <laughs> he comes in, and there's a great slaughter right there in the, in the valley of Jehoshaphat. As he comes in and wipes out the last stand of the Antichrist, that's what we read in Daniel chapter 11, how it closes, right? He, he, try, he makes his stand. But none's there to help him. No one can help him against the armies of heaven. And Jesus Christ returns and saves his people because he is the hope of his people Israel. They have made the right decision to believe on Jesus Christ and to stand with him. They have made a decision to make, their, make sure their heart was right toward the things of God and not to ignore him. And Jesus Christ will come. He will roar out of Zion. He will rule this earth. He is the creator. He will come back and rule. And you and I, in this age of grace, have a glorious opportunity to be part of his heavenly calling, to reign with him in the heavenly places. When the heavens are purged, we are invited up to take a place in heaven where we can rule with, reign, with, with Christ in the heavenly places. But let me tell you, you have a decision to make during your lifetime, much like Israel has a decision you might not be called to battle, but you are called to make a decision about Jesus Christ, whether you're going to believe that He is indeed the Savior of the world, the one who loved for you, loved you and died on the cross for your sins. Whether you're going to trust Him to be your Savior that gives you everlasting life and your hope for eternal life, or whether you're going to go on ignoring Him, closing your heart and your mind to Him, and choose by neglect or by, by just putting it off not to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And I tell you one last time that if that's a pattern with you to say, well, I'll trust Christ later. I'll make a decision to believe on Jesus Christ later. That pretty soon you won't even think about making a decision. It'll just be a flat out no. And you'll suffer the vengeance of God. Let's pray. Don't meet with God in the valley of decision and fight against Him. I guess that's kind of like a thing going on in your heart right now, isn't it? Is Jesus Christ your Savior? Have you chose to love Him? All things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are the called according to His purpose. Either you're called to rule and reign with Him, and out of love you respond, out of faith, I should say, you respond, and you choose, that's what love is, choosing to follow the Lord. And in this case, it's to believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. And so all things work together for the good to those who love God and are the called according to his purpose. Now those who work against his purpose, they will be wiped off the earth. There is a place for all those who are against God. It was prepared for the devil and his angels. And every man that stands against the purpose of God and works against the purpose of God, and believes against the purpose of God, who exalts themselves as if they're God, and makes no decision to put their faith in the Savior, their place will be in that lake of fire with the devil and his angels. Make a decision now, why you can think clearly, why you've had the plan of salvation presented to you. All God wants from you is for you to say, yes, I'm a sinner. I know I can't earn my way to heaven. I know you said your son is the savior of the world. I know you said he died on the cross for my sins. I will believe in his blood. I will receive him as my savior. And you do that and God will save you. That's what he wants. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you now for this day and the things that we've learned. The reality of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Not only is it prophetical, but it's geographical. Father, it's going to be history someday 
and all those who made the right decision are going to rejoice forever and ever, and all those who made the wrong decision will suffer for it forever and ever. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior, who loved us and saved us from these things, we give you our thanks. Amen.